speaker this hour is Brother Michael Shepherd. He works uh, here in Pensacola at the West Side Congregation. And I met him a few years ago. We've had the opportunity to get to know each other a little bit better through the years. Uh, he's spoken on our lectureship before, uh, the se last several times, and always does a terrific job. Uh, he is a great speaker. Gave him the topic of selecting a mate. Uh, he did a real good job, a lot better than what he deserves, actually, but uh, I know a lot of the, I'm surprised I didn't hear a whole bunch of amens on that. <laughs> he and Laverne have two children, and they are with us, along with his mother. Always have been very supportive of the truth and of our lectureship. Uh, we appreciate his stand for what is right. He holds many gospel meetings every year, uh, speaks on several lectureships. So we're glad that he's with us and know that he's going to present us a good lesson dealing with the subject of selecting a mate. Thanks, Mike. I recognize that. You have the last word. <laughs> what a great joy it is that the Lord has privileged us to congregate once again on certainly a subject that cannot be exhausted. So goes the home, goes the school system, goes the world. When we are hurting in our homes, we are going to hurt everywhere else. And certainly we recognize there are so many entities that are supportive, but the home is primary. It is not the school system that is causing the trouble. It is not the police department. It is not the church, the preacher, or the elders, or the boys, or girls club, or YM, or WCA. It is the home. And when we have weak homes, weak homes are going to elect liberal or weak rulers that is going to incorporate liberal laws. Laws that certainly are going to tear up our homes. And so you and I had best give and listen in ear when we have opportunity to discuss matters concerning the home. I see that the wedding ring has been collected from up here. I was wondering whether or not that that ring had been thrown away. <laughs> Sometimes we might need to ask that question <laughs> after all of these lessons today. <laughs> but that reminds me of a, a wife that woke up one night in the middle of the night crying in the hysterics. And she was having a real, real bad dream. So her husband tried to comfort her and he asked her, baby, what is wrong? And the wife responded, I was dreaming about an auction where there were husbands being auctioned off. And the wife said that there were some million dollar husbands being auctioned off and there were some $100,000 husbands and there were $10,000 husbands and and there were even $1,000 husbands. And so the husband responded to his wife. He asked her, he says, well, baby, what kind of husband that in the category I am that I was being auctioned off for? And the wife began to immediately cry again. She says, baby, husbands like you, they had bunched in bunches. And they were selling the bunch for a nickel. <laughs> a nickel a bunch. <laughs> and so it is, it behooves you and I to make sure that we choose the right mate. Today I only have three compositions. And when we have perused the content in the allotted time that has been given me, we will answer the question and give delineating thoughts 
on selecting or choosing the right person to marry. In Proverbs 18 and 22, whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing. Now, no doubt Solomon must believe that proverb. Because in 1 Kings 11 and verse 3, he was the president of the Players Club. He had a thousand. But in verse 4, we see that Solomon, when he was old, his wives turned his heart against God. In verses 5 and following, we see Solomon even go so far to start building denominational places for those wives to even uh, sacrifice their idolatry. And so it behooves us, neighbor, to marry the right mate. Perhaps Solomon, he focused more on uh, quantity instead of uh, quality. In choosing the right mate, I never thought that I would have to start off with this first point. But first of all, the first things for you singles, and I recognize there are several here from Westside, and I'm certainly going to preach to you. <laughs> the first thing that you need to do in choosing the right mate is look upon someone, someone of the opposite sex. In Genesis 2 and verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave father and mother and cleave a glue to his wife. We look at the standard, as has been so beautifully mentioned on last night. And the standard tells us that in order to have marriage, and there is sex is housed in that marriage, and that is who is scripturally married to each other. That must be of the opposite sex. In Matthew 19 and verse 4, Have ye not read, that's an indication of a standard, that he which made them at the beginning, made them both male and female. So don't even consider marrying someone of the same sex. It is ungodly. It is filthy. It is against God's law. For the wrath of God has been revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who holds the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. They understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were faithful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts were darker. But as themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man, and with birds and four footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the loss of their own hearts, to the love of their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural youth of the woman, burning their lusts one toward another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of that era, which was me. And even as they did not like to obtain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, Maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despite for proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, 
not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. 18 to 32 Romans 1. And so therefore we see that same-sex marriages is totally against the plan of God. Did not Paul echo the same sentiment? That those who engage such practices know you not that they will not inherit the kingdom of God or they are going to hell. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Even as Solomon and Gomorrah and like sinners about them, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering vengeance of eternal fire. June 7. And so the first thing that you as singles need to recognize that you consider someone of the opposite sex. And then secondly, after you consider someone of the opposite sex, you make sure he or she is a strong Christian. In Matthew 6 and verse 33, you've heard before, so you hear it again. Seek ye first God's kingdom. You seek someone that is in that kingdom, and you marry that strong person that is in that kingdom, and you have a head store toward heaven. That person who is strong in mind, who is strong in body, who is strong in soul. And thinking about some thoughts about this particular discourse, I will again visit the 1992 Free Hardeman Lectures where many of you are familiar with these uh, sermon that David Sang preached, uh, The Time to Get a Divorce. And I really developed some of the thoughts in that situation. Because there are so many things and so many indicators and so many warnings that you need to pick up on. And the time that you need to divorce that person is before you say I do. When we talk about moral living, our taste, when we talk about moral excellence, when we talk about habits, when we talk about smoking, when we talk about drinking, when we talk about drugging, when we talk about gambling, and on and on and on. The time to divorce that relationship or that situation is before you say, I do. When we think about moral living, young people, and older people that are single, how many partners do you want the person that you're going to marry to have engaged in? Three, five, ten, how many? Those are the things that we need to think about before we engage in saying I do. You need to recognize that there are high risk marriages. There are things that need to be avoided. We're not trying to be mean spirit or anything like that. But there are things that need to be pointed out to you. Because when you get yourself in a situation don't start looking for a passage of scripture for a gospel preacher to compromise on. When we look at high risk marriages, when we look at people who grew up in single parent homes, there are those that have been fortunate enough to escape that situation. But let's always look at God's rule on a matter instead of the exception. God expects one man for one woman for one lifetime, according to Genesis 2, according to Matthew 19, 4 through 6. That's God's permanent law marriage. One exception, we know that. But we're not concerned with that. We're concerned with people making the right choices so their voice will never come up. And so many things in single parent homes, which Brother West showed so very well last night, when that father is absent out of that home, those are things that you need to consider before you marry. When 
those homes had been torn asunder by divorce. It affects those children that come out of those homes. And that thing will come right over into your marriage. Those are things that you need to consider. We are concerned with what saith the scripture. One man, one woman, marry, bear their children, stay together for a lifetime. When we think about hostility that comes out of so many broken homes, that is something you need to consider when you're dating and who you're dating. Abuse, bitterness, all of those are high risk, very high risk. When you marry an adult child, amen. Paul says, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. If I were to go to Brother Paul Brandon's house and, and I see his grandson uh, coming out from under the, 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 the bed, uh, playing with his imaginary friends and his imaginary motorcycles, he's saying, no, 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 all that kind of stuff. It wouldn't alarm me. But if I see Brother Paul Bradley come out from under there, talking about some dun 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 dun, that's going to alarm me. High risk in marrying children are adult children that still want to be children. And not being men, not being grown, not being mature. And not only that, those that are void of spiritual understanding. Does the person that I intend to spend the rest of my life with recognize he or she role in the home, in the church? What about selfishness and self-centered? Those that are unreasonable. Mental abuse is the greatest destruction upon a child's mind. You can actually marry a prisoner. Now of that, when we consider marrying someone that is morally clean and pure and upright in mind, so many times people take that the wrong way. Because the first thing I want to do is marry someone that perhaps uh, has uh, uh, a great figure and big legs. But my question, does that Christian with those big legs are seeking God's kingdom first? Friend, looks can be deceiving. And I'm here to tell you, that first child is going to change that figure. You know what I'm telling you? The outside is changing every day. And if you plan to spend your whole life based on with someone on the outside, how they're looking, when they are 20 and 25, you're going to be in for a rude awakening. I want to marry someone that's got big muscles. Well, my question, is he a faithful Christian with those big muscles? That's my question, friend. We ought to seek God's kingdom first. We need to study book, chapter, and verse instead of 36, 23, and whatever the number is on the bottom. Neighbor, if you marry someone that is too, I know I want to marry someone that is fine and like the Anax that are tall. He's tall. Yes. Well, if you marry somebody that's short, what you need to do later is just stop wearing those high heel shoes and put some fresh shoes on. Maybe that'll equal out something. Yes, brother preacher, but she's a little bit too small. Well, what you need to do, don't take her to Crystal. Take her to one of those all you places. And have some faith and feel. If he's 
too fat. You be his own personal trainer. Friend, the most important thing is he or she a faithful Christian. That's the most important thing, friend. I realize and I recognize that attractiveness comes with the package. But that's not the most important thing. Not by far. If his hair is not the way you want it, buy him a kit. There are several things that you can do. <laughs> you can't go by how people look on the outside. The essential ingredients when it comes to marriage is King Jesus the Christ. We ought to select a mate that are seeking the kingdom first. If you seek the kingdom first, and you marry somebody that is a faithful member in that kingdom, they will one day heaven's door swing wide open for you. You'll thank God one more time that you married somebody that helped me go to heaven, helped my children go to heaven, that had great influence in the church of our Lord. And on your tombstone, you can just put Nehemiah 13, 31. Maybe those that haven't studied Nehemiah in a long time and haven't read it, they might go home and turn that and read it. You know what it says? Remember me, oh my God, for good. We need someone that's going to help us get to heaven. Not only that, when we look at selecting a mate, you make sure there is some Bible study that is done, counseling, good spiritual people that has sailed the marriage seeds for years and years. You need everything that you can get to be helpful in choosing the right mate. God has a role ordained Holy mandated for the husband and one for the wife. The husband role is to love and the wife role is to submit. Are they willing to fulfill that? If not, you better drop them like a hot potato. In Ephesians 5 and verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ also the head of the church, and the Savior of the church. In verse, five, in verse 25, husbands love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. That he might present it unto himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Are you willing to live for your mate as the Bible says, husbands, are you willing to love your wives just like Christ loved the church? I often thought, Brother Michael, uh, that's the reason why the husband has to be the head because God has placed this big, this, this gigantic thing for him to love his wife. And if we love our wives like Christ loved the church, she's going to be blind. She's going to need somebody to lead her around. Amen. Are we willing to die for our wives? I remind of the man that was asked the question, are you willing to die for your wife? He said, hold on, wait a minute, I don't love her that much. Because my love is an undying love. He had a different type of love, didn't he? <laughs> you and I must be able to see God's kingdom first. And fulfill our ordained roles. And when we do that, wives have to submit to that headship. She must offer her submission as unto the Lord comes down and permeate with her husband. You can't beat her into submission. You can't take away the credit cards into submission. She must offer that submission. And it's amazing to me that when we look at death's role in our country, the majority of women that are on death row today, they are there because they have murdered their spouses who was abusive. Now, wait a minute. Don't nobody leave here 
trying to say, I'm not suggesting anything. <laughs> Please don't buy me. <laughs> All I'm saying is, we have to be out of our minds beating on somebody and you got to sleep there, you got to eat there. Submission grows our love. So what we look for to make, we look for someone of opposite sex, we look for someone that is a Christian that is willing to follow God's holy mandates, the role that he has set out for each spouse. And then not only that, we must look to someone that is responsible and not lazy. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, we're going back over these same passages. You notice how when God made Adam from the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, man became a living soul. In Genesis 2 and verse 8, God planted a garden eastward in Eden. There he placed the man. In Genesis 2 and verse 15, God gave that man a job. In Genesis 2 and verse 16, God gave that man divine instructions. Listen to me carefully, friend. God expects some things to be in place when it comes to marriage. That man needs a home to put that wife in. That man needs a job to take care of that wife. And then neighbor, that man needs some divine instructions to run that home with. It's right there in the beginning, friend. Right there in the beginning. Genesis 2 and verse 8. What was Adam's home? The Garden of Eden. He did all of this before he gave that first bride away. She didn't come along until 18 and follow it. When he looked at it as born, and God, God was the first one. That performed the first marital ceremony. First one that gave that bride into marriage. And he did it after Adam had a home. After Adam had a job. His job was to dress that garden and keep it. And then after Adam had some divine instructions. And God, verse 16, and God commanded the man. That's his divine instructions. All of these trees out here. However many it was, thou made three to thee. But there was one tree. Out of all of those trees, one tree affected Eve so much out of all of those trees. So friend, when we're contemplating selecting a mate, when we're contemplating marriage, those three things need to be in place. I realize and I recognize that sometimes during transition, sometimes in the college and things of that nature, uh, our children may have to stay with us sometime. But as soon as they're able to get a job, they ought to get out and make their own way. For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and cleave to his wife. That's what the Bible says. That's exactly what it says, friend. And all of this was done. And therefore, when we establish that home, oh, let us magnify the Lord forever. And together and exalt his holy name. Psalms 34 and verse number 3. There is one thing wrong or worse in being single. Maybe that's being married to the wrong person. We must put the objective standard. Let it be the guide. Let it be the selection process. When we contemplate holy matrimony. Now that, we also must share the same goals. I know people say, well, uh, I can get a divorce for incompatibility. Well, you knew that on your honeymoon, that you was incompatible. That's no reason to get no divorce. It is the Bible that makes us compatible. It is the Bible that makes us one. It is the Bible that we tap into, that we can be alike. In marriage, wives and husbands of male and female are different. God made us that way. But we have an objective standard. And as long as you keep the Bible between you, then there will be 
no problems at all. So we must share the same goal, heaven, to share the same common interest, the church. I remember on last year, Brother Paul Bradley, when he was in, uh, giving that uh, lectureship book, he made a statement that I've used it several times in, in, in proving a point. He said when he and his wife got married, they made a vow not to do anything to disqualify them from the eldership. And I certainly preach that, friend. Because so many times, people do things, and they want somebody to compromise that situation. And I'm not the one. If you go out there and you get your life so fouled up where you can't get married no more, you just can't get married. And that's just all it is to it. Don't tell me a man can't live without a woman. If he want to go to heaven, he can don't tell me a woman can't live without a man. You got your life so fouled up, you disobey God's law, you just can't get married. And so therefore, neighbor, we need to make sure. We need to make sure we have Bible study. Long, thrown out, hard Bible study. Counseling. Before we say I do. Our home's going to have to be created as God would have them to be. Marriages, pure, loving, kind, forbearing, forgiveness, long-suffering, patient, godliness, self-control. Every attribute of the Bible needs to be applied to our marriages. Where we can grow together in love and godliness. Where our homes will be everything that God would have them to be. And when we marry, then we can have our children. And then our children can learn. Third graders, if not before, that God got some laws, neighbor, that we have to abide by, that cannot be compromised, and cannot be gainsaid. The Bible makes us compatible. The Bible makes us agreeable. Heaven and hell cannot exist in the same house. There is no peaceful coexistence between God and the devil. And as has been said before, you marry a child of the devil, you're going to have problems out your father-in-law. You know who I'm talking about, don't you? The devil, your father-in-law. How many times on Sunday morning when the doors open up, we see so many of our Christian sisters coming into the building because of the mistakes that they made. And yet those marriages is 25 and 30 years old and no conversion have taken place yet. Those are things, neighbor, even though we may find ourselves in those situations, you should not want your children or your grandchildren to make the same mistake. And as we move on, when I'm looking for a mate, I had better make sure that they are a candidate for marriage. Scripturally eligible to marry. There must be a determination to make the marriage work. To choose the right mate. It is so very sad. It is heartbreaking. And it weakens the church. God expects our homes to be as He created them to be. When we look at the world that we live in, it's a common thing now. Cohabitation, common thing. Having children without being married, a common thing. The second God in this world today is sports. We in the United States have made a God out of sports. And when you look at sports, the majority of those guys out there come from single parent homes. Come from homes that have been, they've been reared by their grandparents, grandmothers. And that kind of thinking and mentality has carried over in the school system, 
carried over in our young boy's mind. But that's just not God's plan, friend. It's just not God's plan. We bet had bet you has better choose the right mate. And then we need to grow. There have to be growth. There have to be constant study. There have to be constant lectureship attending. There are so many people today who claim to be Christians are so unconcerned with the church, unconcerned with gospel meaning, unconcerned with situations like this that can be so helpful to us, that can stir up our minds by remember, 2 Timothy 1.12, 2 Peter 1.12, 2 Peter uh, 1.3. We must grow. We must be morally pure. We must choose the right mate. And then finally, when we choose the right mate, when we are morally pure, when we establish our homes based on Genesis chapter 2, based on Matthew 19, 4 through 6. We're going to be a stronger nation. So goes the nation, goes our home. We're going to be a stronger church. We're going to have a stronger community. The principles therein that are housed in the Bible in choosing the right mate is very simple. Since evil communication or evil companionship corrupt good morals, I believe it because the Bible says it is. When we marry someone out of that kingdom neighbor, we're not going to be able to serve the Lord without distraction. Worrying about what's going on at home. And why are you sitting in the church building? All of the things that I've said can be somewhat helpful to us. And as we look and grab our songbooks, think about the establishment of the home and how it was done. Think about Genesis 2 and how Adam was given his bride. Think about the divine instructions that they had. And think about Adam had the best father anyone could have. We see, friend, when we leave Scripture, we're opening the doors for Satan to come in. You're in this assembly. And any of the lessons that has been addressed at this hour can address any need in your life. Whether it's by way of dating or by way of selecting a mate. You may recognize that you've not been following God's principles. If this has been aired and been in a public way, we want you to come home today. Ask for strength and make it right. Follow the principles of teaching that one day we can stand in jest in God's sight. You know the way back through repentance, confession, and prayer. And if you're one that has been studying with someone and need to be immersed in water, we love to engage in that endeavor as well. While we sing, I want you to let it be known.